you don't, I don't do a lot of these, so like I do them and then I don't teach them for a year and then I'll, I have to remind myself. Um, so with rationals in general, you, you definitely still want to comp compare everything to zero. So this one's already set up great. You want to simplify. You want to factor, just like rationals would always involve. Now, we are looking for where this function is positive. So let me distract your attention from this question for a second. And let me remind you what a rational graph looks like. Um, there's like asymptotes usually. And let's say, yeah, let's say here to here and here to here. Do you remember rational graphs? So visually, where does this graph change from being above the x-axis to below the x-axis? Like maybe it would be better if I gave you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. At what x values does this change from being positive to negative or negative to positive? Above the x-axis to below the x-axis or below to above? Where's that jump? Three. And? The asymptote, which is actually at five. One, two, three, four, five. So rational graphs can make that transition from positive to negatives anytime there's a zero or, and usually, by the way, if it's a zero, it absolutely will be a change from positive to negative because there's no such thing as like a bounce in here. It's not like it would hit the zero and bounce back up. That's not how rational graphs work. But anytime there's a zero and anytime there's an asymptote. Now the asymptote, it doesn't necessarily it doesn't necessarily have to work that way, but it often does, okay? So what we need to explore is anytime this graph has a zero, where that fraction would equal zero, or an asymptote, a vertical asymptote, where that fraction would be undefined essentially, yes? So when does a fraction actually equal zero? When it's when it's what is zero. A fraction equals zero when it's numerator, right? Oh, yeah. Zero over 50, zero over 10. That's your zeros, your roots, your x-intercepts are going to come from when the numerator equals zero. Your asymptotes are going to come when your denominator equals zero, right? Because that's where you'll get your undefined. Does that make sense? So all of these factors are going to produce a location on the number line that we're going to have to test in and around. x equals 2, x equals negative 1, x equals negative 3, x equals negative 2. So I just need to orient these properly to where they would fall. So negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, and positive 2. And that's just a lot of intervals I have to test in and amongst. But I'm going to do it the same exact way. So if I checked a negative 4, and I'll do my work underneath, a negative 4 minus a 2 is still a negative. A negative 4 plus a 1 is a negative. A negative 4 plus a 3 is a negative. And a negative 4 plus a 2 is a negative. So on the numerator, a negative times a negative is a positive. Denominator negative times a negative is a positive. A positive over a positive is a positive. Are you good there? So is a positive greater than zero? Yes, so we include it. Now, this is where it's going to get a little bit tricky, and you're going to have to think a little bit more about open or closed circles. Because just because these are all closed doesn't mean all of these are going to be closed. Okay? Um, if it's a root, which is these two, 
those will definitely be close. So right on the two and right on the negative one, you can definitely put a closed circle. Because they're in the numerator? Because they're in the numerator. Because if that's where your roots come from, and if you ask someone, is that root value greater than or equal to zero, the answer is yes. The asymptotes, however, are neither. Right? Is the function positive or negative on an asymptote? Or is it actually equal to zero? Neither, right? Because there's no point there. So asymptotes, regardless of this symbol, asymptotes are always going to be open. So that's a stipulation you have to think a little bit more in depth about because rationals are kind of funky. And I'll show you what this graph looks like in a minute. So negative three and lower worked. Well, negative three didn't, but everything lower did. Now, what happens on the opposite side of the asymptote generally is that, generally, not always, is that it goes from negative infinity on one side to positive on the other. So a negative below the x-axis to positive above. Usually, not always. If that asymptote has a degree of 2, it would be like a bounce asymptote where it would do this on both sides of it. Did you know that? It's like the same idea as a double root. It's just a double asymptote where they go the same direction on either side. So don't worry about that because I still want you just to test everything. If I check a negative 1.5, I'm going to get a negative times a negative up top still. I'm checking negative 1.5. Oh, shoot, negative 2.5, sorry. Negative times a negative. Yes, you're right. Still negative, negative on top, sorry. And then negative 2.5 plus 3 would actually be a positive. And negative 2.5 plus 2 would actually still be a negative. So a negative, double negative up top would be a positive over a negative on the bottom. And a positive divided by a negative is a negative. negative. Is a negative greater than 0? No. Negative 1.5 is going to be a negative times a negative up top, a positive and a positive on the bottom, which is a positive over a positive, which is a positive. Does that work? Positive greater than or equal to zero? Yes. So shade that area in. Zero is easy. Negative. Positive. 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 Overall, that'll be a negative, which is not greater than zero. And a three is going to be positive. Positive, 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 positive. Positive is greater than or equal to zero. Boom. So that's the visual presentation of the solutions. Your algebraic presentation has to say x is less than or equal to negative three. Or x can be between negative 2 and negative 1. And remember what that notation looks like. Oh, it's just less than. Oh, boy. It's just less than on the negative 2, less than or equal to on the negative 1. The negative 3 should have been strictly a less than 2. Or x is greater than or equal to 2. You kind of have to hit up all of those. you got to write that out. Like, you need an algebraic answer. And you need a visual answer, yes. Ryan, is that still you serenading all of us? Can you please stop? Ryan, you might have to get used to doing it without humming. You go to college and you tell me how your professor feels about you humming during his class. Or her. The kids next to you might beat you up in the hallway. I'm just kidding. I'm just teasing. They might, though. Somebody might lose their mind. I'm not violent. I'm not violent, so that wouldn't be my answer. But I, I'm sort of losing my mind listening to it. Um, okay, so here's my function, just so you guys can see truly what this looks like. Let me zoom this puppy out. So, 
Yeah, that is not right. <laughs> it doesn't look what? It doesn't look like a graph feature. My graph was a generic graph. I was just graphing it to, to talk about the conversation of where it went from positive to negative. That is not the gra- I had no intention of that. I'm actually going to zoom in rather than going negative 10 to 10 on my Ys. I'm going to go like negative 5 to 5 so we have a clear picture of what's actually happening down here. Um, let me freeze that for one second. So if I obviously look at when it's positive, it's positive until we get over here to our asymptote. Is that negative two? That would be negative one. That's right. We should have zeros at negative one and two. Definitely some heavier stuff than you're used to. All right, next one. This one is obviously less than one. We don't want to compare things to one. That's not going to be in our best interest. We want to compare things to zero, so we have to subtract that one over. And then get a common denominator, which means what does this need? X plus 1, X plus 1. So in my numerator, I'm going to distribute that negative 1. So I'll have 2X minus 1X minus 1 over X plus 1. I'm going to simplify that to just being X minus 1 over X plus 1 is less than 0. This one's going to be much easier because there aren't nearly as many things to test around. We have to test where are our critical points on our number line. 1 and negative 1. And remember, asymptotes are always open circles. So your denominator's 0 of negative 1 is always going to be an open circle because it's coming from the denominator. The numerator, you actually look at the sign, and it's open anyway, so you're good. Test 0, you get a negative over a positive, which is a negative. Is that good or bad? Well, we want it to be less than zero, so actually that's good. Yes? Yes. Okay. Why did you say bad? Oh, I thought you were negative two. 
Negative 2 is going to give us a negative over a negative, which is a positive. That's bad because a positive is not less than 0. And greater than 1, like a 2, is going to give us positive over positive, which is positive, which is not less than 0 either. So your answer is negative 1 less than x less than 1. Algebraic, visual, much easier than the last one. The last one was just kind of crazy because there were so many things to test. And again, I showed you the visual on the first one just for those of you who are with me can understand all of that. It just uh, maybe helps bring it all together and understand. Um, but you won't ever have to do the graph. Get it equal to zero. So I'm going to subtract that four fraction over. I'm going to get a common denominator. So the first fraction needs what, Brock? What do I need to do to this one's denominator to get this one and this one in common? Help them out, Alyssa. It, yep, needs an x plus 5. And the other one needs a what, Brock? Can you help me here? x plus 3. And so in my numerators, I'm going to have an x squared plus a 5x. I also have to distribute a negative 4, so negative 4x minus 12 all over my common denominator. My numerator is going to actually combine to x squared plus x minus 12. So this is going to be fairly new because what can we do with that numerator? We can factor it. x plus 4x minus 3. Oh, you know what? It's not going to be overly new. I was thinking that the x plus 3 and x plus 3 might cancel, but one's a minus and one's a plus. So we've got things to test in and around. We're not going to do all these. Negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, and positive 3. And again, this I cannot stress. In, well, this one, again, it's a little bit easy, but... The negative 5 and the negative 3, which come from your denominator, are 100% of the time coming from the denominator open circles. Here, everything happens to be an open circle because it's strictly less than anyway. And then we're going to test. Four points means there's five intervals to test, which is just a lot. We're going to skip over that because we get the idea, right? Okay. Um, number 12. We'll come back to that one because I think it's going to be about the same. Um, let's talk about 13 quickly because it's absolute value. So this is switching gears, not rational at all, so we don't have to worry about all those concepts that we were hitting home. How do you set up an absolute value inequality? You isolate the absolute value. Great, that's done. You branch, right? What are the two branches going to say, Tori? Perfect. And now we get each of these equal to zero because they're quadratics. And we do all of these. x plus 2, x minus 1. I miss the, uh, this factoring on the second one is just a GCF. Sometimes the simplest factoring problems that are just a GCF are the ones that trip us up the most. It just hap Your mind is just thinking above where it needs to. So you just need to pull out an x and you have an x plus 1. So we have... Things worth testing at negative 2, positive 1, negative 1, and 0. 
Everything here is greater than, so everything's an open circle. And then we start testing. So negative 2 was something we're testing around here. You know what? I'm going to test all of this back in the original. Okay? Because if I'm testing around negative 2 to the left, I'm definitely going to test in this inequality. But if I'm testing in here, the negative 2 came from this guy, but the negative 1 came from that guy, so which one do I test for? So we'll talk about that later, but for now, let's go back to the original. What is negative 3 squared? 9 minus 3 minus 1. Is that true or false? 6 minus 1 is 5. Is the absolute value of 5 greater than 1? We want it. So that's going to be shaded in. Negative 1.5. I'm just going to go to my calculator because we can't do that in our head. Negative 1.5 squared minus 1.5 minus 1 gives us that. The absolute value of that is 0.25. Is 0.25 greater than 1? No. So that's out. Negative 0.5, same thing. Uh, gives us a negative 1.25. Absolute value of that is 1.25. Is that greater than 1? Yes. Count it. 0 0.5. 0 0.5 squared minus 0.5 minus 1. Gives us that as well. Absolute value of that is, oh, I did minus 0.5. I should have done plus. <laughs> Hold on. Negative 0.25. Absolute value of that is 0.25. Is that greater than 1? No. And then 2 we can do again in our head. 4 plus 2 is 6. 6 minus 1 is 5. Absolute value of 5 is greater than 1. These I would not trust are going to go every other at all. Because these are like all intermixed, and they're two different equations. So the, these are trickier. Go back to the original and do it that way. Okay. Your um, 